Hey, what's up YouTube? Today I'm going to revisit my old fog of war system. I worked on a much, much more performant system by leveraging the power of Niagara and the jump float algorithm, GFA for short. I made a lengthy and detailed video about GFA, link should be in the top right corner. Disclaimer, the system I'm going to showcase today is definitely not perfect. It's not a quote-unquote production-ready system, so don't expect to build a AAA RTS game with it, okay? I still rely on blueprints to send data to the GPU, and with hundreds and hundreds of units, that can be a big bottleneck. If you're serious about building an RTS, or any game that is very CPU-intensive, lots of units around and so on, C++ is a bit of a requirement anyway. I tend to stick with blueprints for educational purposes, so that requires me to hack my way through and do all kinds of tricks to find an acceptable solution, which is often a nice exercise anyway, to be honest, I don't mind it. But yeah, the technique I'm going to show today is, I'd say, unusual, and possibly quite sketchy as well, at least in my opinion, but it works. And who knows, it might give you ideas to build a more robust system using C++, or you might simply learn a few things from that video. Now that video is going to be a technical breakdown more than a tutorial. I'm not going to go into a lot of details and I'll go quite fast at times, so apologize. Files are available on my Patreon if you want to take a closer look. Alright, let's jump right into it. First, I thought it'd be a great idea to take a brief look at my old system and see how it works and why it's not that great. Although, arguably, it's not that terrible, architecturally at least. It has the merit of being extremely simple, but yeah, there's a huge bottleneck. For each unit that needs to draw into the fog of war, I draw a material into a rounder target. Hugely, hugely inefficient. It's still a project worth studying though, especially if you're new to blueprints, I suppose. There are lots of interesting bits here and there. Namely, the world space to render target space conversion is definitely something to take a look at, but yeah, this system for sure has its limits. For a super minimalist game where you have two or three units around though, meh, why not? But for anything more, this is not going to cut it. Niagara is Unreal Engine's fancy particle system. So what does a particle system have to do with a fog of war system? Well, simply put, Niagara allows you to compute things on the GPU, and Niagara is so powerful now that it's no longer used for just particle effects. And thus, using GPU emitters, you can do stuff that the CPU can't do, at least not efficiently, especially in blueprints, like sample a texture. Niagara even allows you to send data from a GPU emitter back to the CPU, to blueprints, asynchronously. It's something I explain in detail in my advanced boat simulation course, the link should be in the top right corner. Niagara also has simulation stages to run compute shaders, so you can run complex algorithms for quite cheap, and here I'm talking about the GFA, the jump float algorithm, of course. But first, let's investigate some of the blueprints that make up my fog of war system. First, I have a fog of war manager blueprint. It needs to be added to the world, so you can specify the capture size in centimeters and the fog of war render target resolution. Also, that actor's location controls the capture's x and y position. Next, there's a blueprint library that gives you this get fog of war manager function. I use the get all actors of class node to get the manager, and this isn't ideal, but it's not as bad as people tend to think. Actors are hashed per class, so getting a unique actor of a certain class upon a certain event, on begin play for instance, isn't terrible. Take this with a grain of salt though. And yes, there are often much better alternatives. Ideally, you'd create a subsystem in C++, but again I'm working with blueprints here, so I do what I can. You could also make this fog of war manager be a controller component, and thus you'd be able to get the manager a bit more easily, I suppose. Same but different. Anyway, I get that fog of war manager, and see, this pin is passed as a reference, so I can set it within that library function. That way, you just have to do that in any blueprint, and that's it. This variable points to the fog of war manager, assuming the function could find one and return true. That's step one. Step two, there's a blueprint component you need to add to any actor that needs to draw into the fog of war, like a unit, I suppose. So in that component, on begin play, I first get the manager. 
Next, there are two important events Start and Stop participating. It does what it says. If the actor owning this component needs to draw into the fog of war, then you call that Start event. And if you want it to stop, call that Stop event. Note that upon destruction, that Stop event is automatically called. And upon Begin play, that Start event can also be automatically called if desired. Now these two events simply notify the Fog of War manager of self. That's a pointer to this blueprint. Meaning I simply give the manager a way to keep track of components which owners need to quote unquote participate in the Fog of War. That way it can later get these components settings and also get their owners, the units, right? So again, if that is set to true, that is automatically called. So there's a good chance you don't even have to do anything. See that unit blueprint, it owns that component, that's set to true and that's it. It just works. That's step two. Step three, let's see what the Fog of War manager does with its list of components. Well, on tick, the manager loops through its list of components to first get the specified Fog of War radius for that unit, but also that component's owner's world location, where that unit is in world space. That information is gathered into a vector array to contain each unit's X and Y position, and its fog of war radius, or what I'm gonna call its vision radius. That array, by the way, is pre-allocated upon adding or removing a component to that list. This is event-driven, and it probably doesn't happen that often, so I preferred to do that here than to allocate memory on tick. It probably doesn't make a difference though, but that's why I can use this set array element function with this option disabled. I know this array's length and that one are the same. By the way, the tick rate is lowered to reduce the CPU cost. Still, that won't scale well with many, many units because blueprints have a lot of overhead. Using C++ on a data-oriented system, that'd be a different story, but you can only do so much with blueprints. So yes, this ticked function definitely has a cost. Anyway, next, that array is sent to that Niagara system. That's a system created upon system initialization on begin play here. So I just call this node to add a Niagara component to this actor, next set its system asset, and forward some variables, and that's pretty much it. And that's all there is on the CPU side of things. Sure, there's some more blueprint stuff to this manager, but that's for another feature I'll explain later on. To draw the fog of war regarding blueprints, that's it. That's all the logic there is to it. And that's step 3, and here comes trouble. Step 4, let's dive into that Niagara system. Again, I won't go into too much detail here because implementing GFA in Niagara is something I already covered in a previous video. Basically, in this system, there are two emitters. One for the active fog, one for the passive fog. There are also two under target user parameters, one for the active fog, one for the passive fog. Next, there's a user parameter I call buffer, that's a vector array, and that's what this blueprint sets, right? That list of units information. And there are also a bunch of user parameters, so I can convert an XY position in centimeters from wall space to render target space in pixel coordinates, meaning I need the render target size, capture size, and capture location. That's all set in that blueprint function when I create the Niagara component. Next, I created a render target emitter parameter using that user parameter. And same with the vector array. I also created a grid 2D that is configured in this very simple custom module. It first sets the render target size and then makes sure the grid 2D is of similar size. I'm trying to keep this video somewhat short for once, so I'm going a bit fast here. Please have a look at my neighbor grid 3D video for a more beginner friendly introduction to Niagara. Finally, I created an integer I called GFA passes, because remember, the GFA works in multiple passes. 8 passes for a 256 texture, 9 for a 512 and so on. Next, using a first simulation stage that iterates on this vector array just once, I quote-unquote inject the vision. Meaning, for each unit, I get its position in world space, see where that is in the render target, so converted into a pixel coordinate. Thus, that gives me the grid 2D cell to look for, because both have the same size. Next, I check the value stored in that cell, if any. This grid 2D is empty at first, but I loop through these units one by one, and multiple units may be in the same grid cell. So this cell may contain some data from an already processed unit. That data, by the way, is just a vector. The first two components store the unit position in grid space, so the cell X and Y index, 
and the third component stores the unit's vision radius in cells as well. Meaning if that unit is able to see one kilometer all around it, that corresponds to a number of cells, based on the capture size and total amount of cells. So having that grid cell vector, I only override it if this unit's vision radius is greater than the one stored in the vector, if any was stored. For the sake of keeping this algorithm as simple as can be, I assume there can only be one unit per cell, and so it has to be the one that sees the further, if that makes sense. And that's the result, that's what I called injecting the unit's vision. Each non-black cell in that grid 2D contains a vector. That vector's x and y components store the cell's x and y index, and the z component stores the highest vision radius of all units in that cell. Once I have that information, well, it can be propagated using GFA quite efficiently across the entire texture, and thus the entire map. And once propagated, I can then compute a distance field meaning each pixel contains the unit's initial x and y position and its vision radius. Thus, for each pixel, I can check how far that pixel is to the initial position and compute a normalized distance based on the vision radius to create the fog of war. And that can simply be written into the active fog of war rounder target. And voila, that's the vision of all units at a given time. Quite cool, huh? So right away, there are a few things to note. In principle, the amount of units doesn't contribute that much to the overall cost, because the GFA cost is fixed and solely based on the texture resolution. The texture resolution drives the amount of GFA passes needed to propagate the information across the entire texture, right? So that cost is what it is, regardless of the unit count, and that's it. Now that's on paper, the amount of units does obviously matter, for two reasons. One, the unit's positions and vision radius need to be sent to Niagara, so you have to somehow compute that buffer in blueprints first, and that's not going to scale very well with lots of units. Two, there's still this inject vision step that goes through that unit buffer, but at this point, this happens on the GPU, and even looping through two or three thousand vectors isn't necessarily going to be a huge issue as far as I know. So yeah, the jump float algorithm is quite a cool algorithm, but it's still probably best if you don't have 3000 units to deal with in the first place. You get my point. Now for the passive fog, that's much simpler. I simply read the active fog rounder target and accumulate it in a grid 2D using a max operation. And then I write that value into the passive fog rounder target. That essentially paints the rounder target with the active fog, if that makes sense. Now, having two render targets is cool, but how is the fog of war actually drawn on screen? When this fog of war manager blueprint is initialized, I first create the two necessary render targets. One for the active fog, one for the passive fog. Those are the same two render targets used in Niagara as well, right? Next, still upon initialization, I create a dynamic material instance of a post-process material, because see, this blueprint owns a post-process volume. It's unbound, so active at all times, and it's configured to make use of that post-process material, which is itself configured to use these two render targets. So the material is expected to have a texture parameter named active, and one named passive, and indeed it does. So both textures are projected in wall space in a top-down fashion, using the coordinates provided by this blueprint, capture size and position. I then combine both textures in this post-process material using a max operation to lerp between the rendered image and a black color. You may want to render this post-process material before TAA though, to get rid of aliasing. Now a fog of war system may be quite a complicated thing to build because what's drawn on screen is really only the tip of the iceberg. Most often, you must also be able to tell if a unit is in the fog of war for gameplay reasons. Maybe you spotted an enemy building and then backed away, so that building is now in the passive fog of war, thus displayed using its last known state. However, at that point, during the game, something may happen to that building, and so the system needs to know if that building is in the fog of war, at least from my own point of view, as a player, to know if I should be aware of any changes. And that's where readback events come into play. You may ask the fog of war manager if an actor, any actor, is in the fog by calling this function. 
Now to receive an answer, this actor must implement that blueprint interface, because the fog of war manager is going to send that answer in a delayed fashion a couple of frames later using this interface. That way the manager doesn't have to cast to call a function of a certain blueprint class or do weird things, interfaces are great. Now the way this works is super duper sketchy, but again it works. First, when the fog of war manager gets asked if an actor is in the fog, it compiles a list of all actors having asked that question this frame, and if any, it asks for this event to be called the very next frame. Thus, next frame, that event then calls this function if the system isn't currently waiting for an answer. This function creates a list of all valid actors having asked if it's in the fog on their x and y position. That 2D position array is sent to a second Niagara system, which is then reinitialized. It's reinitialized because it needs to spawn one particle per item in that position array. On particle update, I then convert the X and Y positions stored in the array from world space to UVs to sample the fog of war texture at the correct location. Next, using an export particle data interface, I just tell Niagara, hey, add this to the list of things you need to send to this blueprint. And this blueprint is an object user parameter that is set in blueprint here to self. So Niagara is going to send this data back to this blueprint asynchronously, meaning usually two frames later. Thus, to receive the data, this blueprint needs to implement this interface and then implement this event. So if that blueprint was waiting for an answer from Niagara, I loop through that data buffer, so one struct per particle, so one per actor, because I ensure these two arrays were identical and locked while this was true. So get the actor at that index and send it the value read from the fog of our texture that I packed in that float via that blueprint interface. And then that actor can do something with this answer. Now I just really hope that the order is guaranteed between the indexes in the buffer I sent and the buffer I received, and so far all seems to point that that is true. If not, then I would probably need to pack some kind of actor identifier in the particle data as well. So it's a bit sketchy, a bit complicated, lots of moving components to that feature, but it seems to work. Every unit can somewhat efficiently ask if it's in the fog of war at any desired rate and do cool things with that information. Like, oh, here's an enemy building, let's back off. Then let's assume something happened to that building, but I shouldn't be aware of it for now, unless it's visible again. And oh, that unit apparently got damaged, right? That's a way you can implement that kind of logic. Now I can't emphasize enough how sketchy that solution is, and it's obviously not replicated. I'm not crazy enough to do that, and I just don't have the time to tackle that, frankly. Plus, I'm not necessarily interested in networking anyway. So yeah, it was an interesting experiment, but that's all that is, to be honest. Again, at this point, you really should implement your own solution in C++. UE is a game engine that can do pretty much everything, but as such, you can't expect it to provide a solution to every possible problem. At one point, you're expected to fall into a bit of a niche category, and Fog of War is kinda niche, and can be tackled in many, many different ways. Plus, it often has a GPU component and a CPU component, so it'd be unrealistic to expect UE to offer a proper solution. It's not its job. But still, it's quite impressive to see how far you can go with Blueprints and Niagara. By the way, this project also includes a few extra goodies, like a box selection, kinda cool. I'm just using the HUD class and its built-in getActorsInSelectionRectangle function. There's also this minimap with the proper camera view drawn onto it. That's done by converting the four screen corners from screen space to world space, then using a ray plane intersection, I get where these points intersect with the ground plane. And each intersection is converted to render target space and forwarded to a UE material. Next, using segment sign distance fields, I draw these four lines and that's it. So quite a few interesting things packed into that project. Files are available as a tier 2 reward on my Patreon, along with many, many other cool educational projects, demos and assets. That's it for today's video, thanks so much for watching, thanks to you all for the incredible support, I feel very grateful. Alright, see you in the next video, in the meantime, take care of yourself, bye bye.